Good evening. According to these newly leaked emails which came out of Pfizer, well, it looks like their corporate executives, they were making a concerted effort to obfuscate the fact that cells derived from an aborted fetus were used during the research and testing of the COVID vaccine. Meanwhile, three years after President Trump had America leave the UN Human Rights Council due to the fact that many countries on the Human Rights Council were, well, abusers of human rights, well, as of yesterday, America is back in. We have now officially rejoined the UN Human Rights Council and sit on there alongside countries like Cuba, China, Eritrea, and Venezuela. And then lastly, with the deteriorating situation at the U.S. southern border, particularly with not too long ago thousands of Haitian migrants trying to cross into the U.S., I took the opportunity while I was down in Texas to sit down and speak with Mr. Todd Bensman, who is a senior national security fellow with the Center for Immigration Studies, and we discussed the reality of how people from 120 different countries are using our porous southern border in order to get into America. Let's go through it all together. This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now let's begin today's discussion by talking a bit about Pfizer. And to start with, even though we've mentioned it on several previous episodes, I think it's worth reiterating why exactly so many people of faith, particularly Christians, are claiming to have a religious objection to taking the vaccine. The reason stems from the fact that during the research and development of the mRNA vaccines, they employed fetal cell lines which are cells that are grown in a laboratory that were ultimately derived from aborted fetuses. Now, to be perfectly clear, it is not the case that aborted fetal cell lines are in these mRNA vaccines themselves, but rather that they were employed during the vaccine's research. However, even though technically this is not a secret, still many people don't know about it. And one of the reasons might be the fact that the media in this country, by and large, they don't talk about it, they just ignore it. However, a second reason might be the fact that Pfizer themselves downplay this issue. And how do we know that? Well, according to these newly released emails, which just came out of Pfizer and they were actually leaked to Project Veritas, well, that appears to be exactly what is happening. In fact, in a video that Project Veritas released just a few days ago, they interviewed a woman by the name of Melissa Strickler, who was a Pfizer manufacturing quality auditor. And by the way, I say she was a quality auditor because she was fired after the video was released. And Melissa, she produced what she identified as internal emails, which showed top officials within Pfizer discussing how they can downplay within their corporate communications the role that embryonic cell lines played in the COVID vaccine development program. Now, in terms of why exactly Ms. Strickler decided to come forward and produce these leaked emails, well, she explained her reasoning very succinctly. If they're being this deceptive about it, I don't feel comfortable being silent. I felt it was the right thing to do. They don't want to have to deal with people that are upset because I think people can use religious exemptions for it and they don't want that. I think they want nobody to have an excuse not to get it. Now specifically, what these emails appear to reveal is the Pfizer corporate strategy to sidestep this hot button issue entirely. In fact, let's go through some of these emails together. So this one here, the first one, it came from February 4th and it was sent by Ms. Vanessa, Vanessa Gelman, who is Pfizer's senior director for worldwide research development as well as medical communications. And in it, she says that the firm should just steer clear of the topic of fetal cell lines altogether. She wrote specifically that, quote, we have been trying as much as possible not to mention the fetal cell lines. She then followed up on this topic in a second email that was sent on February the 9th, where she wrote that, quote, We want to avoid having the information on the fetal cells floating out there. We believe that the risk of communicating this right now outweighs any potential benefit we could see, particularly with general members of the public who may take this information and use it in ways we may not want out there. Now, to pause here for a moment, what she's re specifically referring to in this part of the email is a little bit murky. It's not exactly clear. If you are a cynical person, you might look at that and say, hey, you know what? That could hurt the bottom line of Pfizer, which, of course, is a publicly traded company. And having more people know that they use these fetal cell lines in the testing of this vaccine could have less people take the vaccine. And therefore, that could hurt their profit. However, a more forgiving look at this statement might say, hey, she believes that the vaccine is super helpful. And if more people knew that the fetal cell lines were employed, regardless of the profit to the company, just less people will take the vaccine and it'll be worse for society. You can decide for yourself what she meant by that. Then her email says something that I just love. She writes, quote, we have not received any questions from policymakers or media on this issue in the last few weeks. So we want to avoid raising this if possible. 
Ah, uh, yes, the lovely media in our country. Since the media have not asked about it in weeks, then it's understandable that it's not a topic of interest. And technically, in a society like ours, where the media drives the public agenda, well, that is actually an accurate statement. But the reason that it's doubly interesting, at least to me, is that once these emails were actually leaked, well, the corporate media outlets in this country, they right away took to playing defense. For instance, when I was actually trying to find a copy of these emails for myself, I went over to Google and I typed in Pfizer leaked emails. And then instead of getting these emails as the top results, instead what you see are a bunch of links from the approved media outlets about how this is not real news. But interestingly, I went in and when you actually read those articles, they aren't actually debunking the content of these emails because, I mean, you can't do that. These emails are what they are. But instead, what they're debunking are people's claims about the emails in which they say that the vaccine itself, the mRNA vaccines themselves, contain the cells of aborted children. Now, of course, that is not true. However, the way that those articles are framed, the way that they frame these points, makes it seem to the casual observer who's just reading the headlines that the entire thing is fake, that there's nothing to see here, and that you shouldn't even be looking at these emails because as two of those headlines say over at the very top of the Google search results, quote, it's not real news. Regardless, let's get back to these emails themselves. Ms. Gelman, she then goes on to cite a statement from officials saying that regarding these fetal cell lines, they have, quote, tried really hard not to share unless it's strictly necessary and mission critical. Statement goes on to read, quote, one or more cell lines with an origin that can be traced back to human fetal tissue has been used in laboratory tests associated with the vaccine program. Then Mr. Philip Dormitzer, who is Pfizer's chief scientific officer, he wrote this, quote, HEK 29.3 T cells used for the IVSA are ultimately derived from an aborted fetus. The Vatican Doctoral Committee has confirmed that they consider it acceptable for pro-life believers to be immunized. Pfizer's official statement couches the answer well and is what should be provided in response to an outside inquiry. Now that is a very interesting statement because first of all, it's not exactly clear why the Vatican's decision on this matter should feature so prominently in their corporate statement since, as we all know, it's not only Catholics who hold pro-life, anti-abortion views. And in fact, even within the Catholic faith, not everyone agrees with the Vatican stance on this matter. Regardless, this was the corporate communication strategy that they ultimately went with. And secondly, what the Pfizer's chief scientific officer referred to in that email, that HEK293T line of cells that Pfizer uses, well, those cell lines actually originated from kidney cells, which were taken from a fetus aborted back in 1973 over in the Netherlands. And to give you a bit of more context on these particular line of cells, here's how Dr. James Lawler, who is an associate professor over at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, here's how he described them. The COVID-19 vaccines do not contain any aborted fetal cells. However, fetal cell lines, cells grown in a laboratory based on aborted fetal cells collected generations ago, were used in testing during research and development of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, and during production of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. He then went on to say that using these types of cells is a very common testing method in terms of making new medicines. And then he added this, quote, the individual cells from 1970s and 1980s abortions have since multiplied into many new cells over the past four or five decades, creating the fetal cell lines I mentioned above. Current fetal cell lines are thousands of generations removed from the original fetal tissue. They do not contain any tissue from a fetus. However, regardless of that fact, Pfizer decided to in their corporate messaging at least, obfuscate that fact altogether. And given the rise in religious objections to these mandatory vaccine mandates, it seems like many people don't feel that it's conscionable to use a product that was tested in this manner, even if the final product itself does not contain any aborted fetal cells. Regardless, if you'd actually like to read these emails for yourself, or if you'd like to watch the interview of Project Veritas actually speaking to that whistleblower, I'll throw the links to all that into the description box below this video. And all I ask in return is that you take a quick moment to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now let's discuss how the U.S. has officially rejoined the other human rights defenders over in the U.N. Human Rights Council, such as China, Cuba, Venezuela, and Eritrea. Sorry. What's this? That's a great question, Roman, and it is today's sponsor, which is an awesome messaging app called Secure. And it's awesome if you actually care about your privacy, because it's not a big secret that our data is being mined and remined by all these big tech companies. And in the year 2020, over 155 million Americans, likely including you and me, were affected by data breaches. And by the way, that's only what's publicly known. However, with Secure, all that stuff that happened in the past, it's in the past, because your emails and messages moving forward can remain private. That's because 
They have their servers and data centers located right here in Kabul, Afghanistan. No, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. They actually have their data centers and servers here in Switzerland. Now, why does that matter? Well, Switzerland has some of the strictest data privacy laws in the entire world, and they're not subject to the Cloud Act. And if you want to know what that is, head on over to secure.com under their FAQ section, and they explain exactly what that is. Now, the thing that I love most about them is that they don't collect your phone number, they don't collect your private data, they don't mine your data, they don't collect the phone numbers of your friends and family, instead everything is private, and best of all, if your friends and family don't use the secure app, it doesn't matter, because the way it works, it, all your messages are still routed through Switzerland, and everything remains private almost no matter what. So head on over to secure.com and use promo code ROMAN to get 25% off, and the rates aren't even that expensive to start with, it's only $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger combo, and they offer a 7-day free trial. So head on over to secure.com, use promo code ROMAN to get 25% off, and now Roman in the studio, back to you. And now let's move on over and talk about the UN. Three years ago, as you might remember, President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the UN Human Rights Council because he said that it was essentially an organization that was protecting human rights abusers. Specifically, back then, President Trump said that the council had failed to live up to its name, and he cited China, Cuba and Venezuela as being simultaneously some of the worst human rights abusers on the planet while at the same time sitting on the council. And as an example of how ridiculous this actually is in practice, well, consider the case of China, which has been leveraging their seat on the UN Human Rights Council to be a platform to expand their influence. So for instance, a man by the name of Zhang Duan, who is the minister at China's mission to the UN, he was recently appointed to a five-member panel within the UN Human Rights Council, which actually helps to select the independent investigators who are sent out to investigate human rights atrocities. Now think about that for a moment. There is a Chinese official on a five-person panel that selects the independent investigators that actually go out to examine human rights abuses. I mean, the irony there is self-evident. Even according to our own State Department here in America, the Chinese Communist Party is actively, currently committing genocide. And yet for some reason, that has yet to be properly investigated by the UN Human Rights Council. It's a real mystery as to why that is. Regardless, America is back in. That's right, as of yesterday, America has officially rejoined the UN Human Rights Council and will now sit alongside the other 46 countries who are on there, including of course the People's Republic of China, Eritrea, Cuba, the Sudan, Pakistan, as well as many others. Now, to be more specific, America's new three-year term will begin on January the 1st of 2022, so in a few months. Now, in terms of the reasoning behind the Biden administration's decision to rejoin the council, well, they seem to believe that they can do more good on the inside rather than on the outside. In fact, when announcing this decision, here's what the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Anthony Blinken, here's what he said after acknowledging the council's flaws. He said that improving the council and advancing its critical work is best done with a seat at the table. Furthermore, here is what our own U.S. ambassador to the U.N. said in a statement regarding this move. America will initially focus on what we can accomplish in situations of dire need, such as in Afghanistan, Burma, China, Ethiopia, Syria, and Yemen. Our goals are clear. Stand with human rights defenders and speak out against violations and abuses of human rights. We'll also oppose the Council's disproportionate attention on Israel. And so we'll just have to wait and see whether that will be what actually happens, whether the U.S. under the Biden administration is actually able to change the U.N. Human Rights Council from the inside. If you'd like to read more about this new development, I'll throw the link to that into the description box below this video. And all I ask in return is that if you haven't already, take a quick moment to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now let's move on over and talk about the U.S. southern border. The situation that we are seeing at the U.S. southern border appears to be deteriorating by the day. In fact, this year, 2021, month after month, we've had record-breaking numbers of migrant encounters at the southern border. In fact, it seems like every single month, there's a new record that is set. Now, what I'd like to particularly highlight, what I'd like to particularly focus on in today's episode, though, is how not too long ago, thousands of Haitian migrants were trying to cross into the U.S. via the southern border. And so the big question that a lot of people had when they saw that was how did thousands of Haitians travel thousands of miles to reach the U.S. southern border? And so, in order to examine that question, I took the opportunity while I was down in Texas to sit down and speak with Mr. Todd Bensman, who is a senior national security fellow with the Center for Immigration Studies, and we discussed what he saw during his time being south of the U.S. southern border, and specifically, the reality of how people from over 120 different countries are using our lax immigration system in order to sneak into America. Take a listen. My um, most recent trip was to the Nicaragua-Costa Rica border. I just spent 10 days there, and I went there because the number of immigrants that are not from Central America and not from Mexico 
uh, was about 40,000, 50,000, I'm sorry, in May, which is the mm. most recent numbers that came out, which is a 700% increase from the May of a year ago and a four time percent increase since January. So uh, something's clearly going on with the uh, people that are coming in from all over the world. And what it is is that there is an international trail that literally connects the entire world to the U.S. southern border. So I met migrants coming through there who are from Mauritania, the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, five of them from Eritrea coming through, many, many from Eritrea, from these African countries, from Senegal who are coming through. And these are areas that um, pose a little bit of a different threat uh, vector than than would uh, people coming in from uh, families coming in from Central America uh, because they're coming from countries that have uh, terrorism activity in them or they're coming from African countries, sub-Saharan African countries that uh, are riven by tribal atrocity uh, zones and warlords and terrible things that are happening and so when people are uh, from those countries are coming to the southern border through that route, uh, they pose a, a, a vetting issue, a security vetting issue is, um, I guess, the best way to, to say that. But Well, so there's quite a few things to unpack there. So first of all, as you said, 50,000 uh, 50, of the migrants who came through the U.S.-Mexico border in May were people not from, you said, Mexico. Or Central America. Or, or Central America. Most Americans are familiar only with this crisis as involving Central Americans and Spanish speakers. Right. Doesn't. So th does that include South Americans? Yeah, there are uh, South Americans coming through uh, right now and Cubans and Haitians, a lot yeah. of Haitians. Does that, is that included in this 50,000 number? Yes. Okay. Yes. So do you, do you have a breakdown? So you, you listed quite a few countries like from Africa, but, but, but is it predominantly from people from Africa or is it like predominantly people from South America? I would say that, first of all, there, there are people coming in from about 120 different countries. Mm. The collective number of those, we don't really know right now because they're, they've stopped releasing that data. Mm. We were expecting to get that data for 2020 in about January, February of this year, and it's not been forthcoming, so we don't have a good breakdown of how many. But from just anecdotal uh, numbers and looking at family units, we can see that a very significant percentage are going to be Haitians coming mm. from, not from Haiti, uh, they're coming actually from Chile. Mm. Uh, I didn't meet a single Haitian who's lived in Haiti in five or six years. Mm. Uh, so, so there's about 185,000 Haitians living in Chile and a lot more in, in Brazil. And when they heard that the border was opening, especially to family units, they're coming. Mm. So that's why you're seeing, and they're going to claim asylum as well, even though they are firmly settled in a very safe country with the strongest economy in South America. A lot of them are Haitians, but uh, there are also a lot of immigrants that are coming from places like Bangladesh and Yemen and uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran and places that are of terrorism concern to uh, Homeland Security agencies mm. here. So when those guys hit the border, there's this whole other aspect yeah. of uh, national security concern that doesn't uh, apply to any other kind of uh, immigrant that's coming through here. So how does it actually look on the ground? When you talk to, for instance, Eritrea, right? Yeah. Like from my understanding, that country is very repressive. Yes. And I can imagine that people who are fleeing it, perhaps potentially, maybe they're they're a part of the you know regime. Maybe they're people who are anti-America. But I can also imagine there are people who are just fleeing the country for their own public yeah, safety. Of course. Do you believe that from the from the people you spoke with and, and your impression of it? Do you believe that they're the latter or that they pose a threat to America? And not just from Eritrea, but from these other countries as well. My, my gut is that most of uh, the folks that are coming from countries like that, Eritrea are fleeing some sort of persecution or some kind of oppression, but definitely economic, um, you know, uh, problems. Mm. So they are going to want to live in a place where they have better opportunity. The issue really comes down to 
the fact that the majority of these folks will show up at the border with no identification whatsoever and no way for us to call the Eritrean government to ask about them mm -hmm. because they're just not going to, A, they don't have the capability uh, half the time, like in Somalia. Uh, and so we don't know who they are. We don't know if they are oppressors or oppressed, mm -hmm. persecuted or persecutees. We just, we just had a Ethiopian that the Department of Justice prosecuted uh, for hiding his uh, history in Ethiopia as a, as a torturer. Mm -hmm. He's a war criminal and he managed to just lie his way through to U.S. citizenship and uh, now they finally got around to him, you know, uh, 20 years later. Mm. Uh, so we don't really know who's coming through is the problem. What way is it supposed to work if somebody's fleeing a country? Let, I, I get Eritrea is a good example just because it's such an extreme example, right? But let's say they're fleeing Eritrea and they wind up in, well you said you met some Eritreans in, uh, in Nicaragua, Costa Rica border, right? Yes. So. Once they're in that country, seven, seven of them, is it the case that they're technically in like a, a freer country than where they fled from? They could file asylum there and then they should stay there. Is that sort of the way that it should be working? Well, it's, I mean, it's a policy consideration uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, the thinking was um, if you're drowning, uh, you're going to reach for the end of a sharp sword no mm -hmm. matter what. And you're going to take that sharp sword and rescue yourself. You don't, when you're dr actually drowning, decide which uh, life raft is the best one right. of the life raft. So you have this thinking that, well, the first country that you come to from Eritrea, maybe a neighboring country would be better than Eritrea. Or um, Chile is a great example. It's a, a nice country, a beautiful country. None of the Haitians that I talked to had any complaints, uh, serious complaints about Chile. Uh, one of them was showing me on his cell phone, you know, beautiful beaches and the nightlife and that sort of thing. And all of them said there was absolutely no government persecution, but this is a chance to upgrade your lifestyle from good to better. Mm. And, and so that's, I think it's a policy thing. You know, uh, you're going to pass, these Eritreans are passing through 10 different countries that are all better than uh, Eritrea. Mm. Uh, take the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. Uh, these were all military-aged young men speaking French, so I, I really couldn't communicate with, with them because uh, neither I nor my translator had, had any French. Mm. But, um, you know, things are not that great in Mauritania. It's a, it's a, a, a sparse, uh, it's a kingdom, mm. you know, there's a, it's a dictatorship, and, you know, they've got uh, problems there. Uh, but, you know, you could argue that these Mauritanians could go really you know, to dozens of other places before they came here. And we, do, we are not gonna know anything about them. Now, Mauritania is on the edge of the Sahel Desert, uh, which is a place that is riven with Al Qaeda franchises and ISIS franchises and uh, extremist ideologies. And I hope that when those guys get to the border that somebody's gonna have time or inclination to really uh, investigate what they're about. Mm. Otherwise, it'll be something we hear about on the news about a shopping mall that got shot up six months from now. Oh, so you you said it's a policy issue. What is the current policy? Because I, I remember reading about I forgot the exact name for it, but it was a uh, it was that if you hit if if you're escaping persecution or you're you're a refugee and you hit a country that before you hit the United States of America, a friendly country, technically you should be filing your refugee claim there. Is that is that is that still the case? No, uh, that was the case. That was a Trump era policy. Well, what was the name of that policy? Uh, safe, uh, safe third country, mm. and uh, that meant that if you if you passed through, but you had to have countries get on board with that, mm. and not all of them were getting on board with that. Guatemala was one that that did get on board with it. Uh, so if you were coming from Honduras and passing through Guatemala, and you didn't apply for asylum in Guatemala then you were ineligible to apply in the United States. Well, 
the very first thing the Biden administration did was dump that. Mm. So now they're all coming through. There's none of that happening now. If you'd like to read more about what is happening over at the U.S. Southern border, I'll throw the links to several articles into the description box below this video for you to check out. And now lastly, since you've completed this episode of Facts Matter, I would highly recommend that you go on over to Epic TV and check out an awesome new episode of Counterpunch with Trevor Loudon, where Trevor exposes a leftist German political party, which is not only influencing U.S. politics at every level, but is also working to move America inch by inch towards socialism. Here's a trailer for that episode. But I'm going to talk tonight about an organization that has never really got any public attention, but it is interfering in American politics, and it does have communist roots. They're training people here for leadership roles in the U.S. political left. So this is a German taxpayer-funded political organization run by former East German communists who are very close to Russia training American left-wing political leaders. Is this legal, do you think? If you'd like to check out that awesome episode as well as all the other phenomenal content over on Epic TV, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be right there at the very top of the description box. I hope you click on it. I hope you check it out. I hope you subscribe. And I hope that you join us on this journey of exploring this beautiful, beautiful world through honest journalism that is based in truth and tradition. Now, lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already in order to get this type of honest news content delivered directly into your YouTube feed while YouTube still allows it. Also, consider hitting that notification bell so you can actually be notified of any new videos as we release them. And lastly, if you have an Instagram account, consider following me at Epic Times Roman. I publish behind the scenes research as well as spicy memes. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.